In the next few videos, we'll describe finite dimensional C star algebras, their associated maps that preserve their algebraic structure, and maps that associate a slightly weaker structure, namely the notion of positivity. And then we'll relate these ideas to stochastic maps between sets, finite sets specifically. So let's get started by roughly saying what a, a C star algebra is. It is a algebra, and let's just say our algebras are over the set of complex numbers. So algebra just means that you have a vector space, and you can multiply the vectors as well, and that multiplication is distributed over that vector addition. So C star algebra is an algebra with an involution, and an involution means that you have, let's call this C star algebra A. So it's with an involution, star, which is a map from A to A. And this map being an involution means that if you apply it twice, you get back to where you started. And because it's an involution, it is also an anti-homomorphism. So it, if you'd have an, two elements, A1 and A2, and then you take their star, this actually equals A2 star, A1 star. So you apply it in the other direction. We'll give examples of this definition in a moment. So it has an involution and a norm. Satisfying several conditions. Rather than specifying all of these conditions, which you can look up in the literature rather easily, i much rather give you an intuition for what these objects look like, um, several examples, and how you can manipulate them and understand them a little bit better. So let's just give our first example. The main example is the algebra of complex numbers. Now the involution is just taking the complex conjugate. It is a vector space. We can add numbers. We can also multiply numbers, so we get an algebra. It's distributive. There's a norm. The norm is just the usual norm of a complex number. So it's the square root of the square, the sum of the squares of each of its real and imaginary parts. Another example that's very, very closely related to this one is if you take x to be any set, any finite set. Let's just start off with finite ones since that'll make things a lot easier. If we take any finite set x, then we can look at the set of functions from x to c. So that's my notation for functions from x to c. And we can take the norm. Well, there are many ways that we can define the norm. But for instance, we can take the supremum norm. Um, so it's going to be the supremum of a given function. Take the absolute value of that function point-wise using the um, norm on C. And then after we take that um, value point-wise, we take the maximum of those. Now notice that every element of this vector space, so every function on Cx, can be written as a sum of taking that function, evaluating it on the element x, and then multiplying it by the unit vector that takes the value 1 at x and 0 everywhere else. So I'm going to call that unit vector E subscript x. This is going to be a sum over all x and x, where Ex is the function when you plug in another x, let's call it x prime, we get the Kronecker delta xx prime. Now, this enables us to understand the supremum norm a little bit better. The norm of f is going to be take the norm of each of these f of x's and then take the biggest one. Let's look at another example. Now, we're going to look at our example. Uh, our first example where the multiplication doesn't commute. So if we take mn, these are n by n complex matrices. Now in this case, 
the algebra structures, the usual algebra structure on n by n matrices. We multiply by matrix multiplication. And the involution here is equal to the conjugate transpose. And the supremum and the norm in this case, um, you can take this to be the operator norm, for instance. And a norm that's very similar to this is um, you can, for instance, uh, if, if you have a matrix that is uh, diagonalizable, um, then the operator norm applied to that matrix gives you the absolute value of the largest eigenvalue of, of that matrix. So it gives you a way of thinking about what this norm um, gives you. Another example is direct sums of many of these. So this is very similar to this example because this is essentially a direct sum of the cardinality of x, many copies of c. And in this case, we can also have several copies of matrix algebras as well. So these are, by the way, called, we're going to call, if I ever use the word matrix algebra, this is what I mean. Any algebra of the form mn. So now, if we take several copies of matrix algebras and we take their direct sum, then the multiplication is defined pointwise. So if we have a vector of matrices, let's call it B, and then we have another vector of matrices, let's call it B prime with a vector, then this is, by definition, these are, you can think of an element of the direct sum as a vector of matrices. So we get B1 as being an N1 by N1 matrix all the way down to B T, which is a NT by NT matrix, and then multiply that by B prime 1 all the way down to B prime T. And this is just the pointwise multiplication. So it's B1, B1 prime. Now here we're doing ordinary matrix multiplication. So first we do pointwise multiplication, like we would multiply functions pointwise, and then we do matrix multiplication when we look at which components we're actually isolating. And the involution is taking the involution pointwise, and the involution on the pointwise pieces is the complex conjugation, the conjugate transpose of matrices. And the norm here, we can take the supremum norm combined with the operator norm. So the supremum over the operator norms, for instance. That's one way of thinking about what the norm is. So these are all very useful and interesting examples of C star algebras. In fact, these are all, all finite dimensional C star algebras look like these. So these are the objects in the category that we'll be working with, which will be the category of C star algebras and their associated morphisms. And the first class of morphisms that we'll look at are star homomorphisms. So if, if a and B are C star algebras, a star homomorphism from A to B, let's call it F, and I just realized that I forgot one of the most important um, things that I'll be using here is that these all, all of these examples have an identity element. So it's a, it's a C star algebra um, we're also going to assume that it's unital as well, and a unit element, 1a in a, which acts as a unit for the multiplication. So all of my star homomorphisms will preserve that, and sometimes people call these unital star homomorphisms, but these are all the ones that I'll be working with. So star homomorphism between two such C star algebras preserves all algebraic structure. So it's a function that preserves all such algebraic structure. And what do I mean by that? It's linear with respect to the addition, and it's a homomorphism with respect to the multiplication. So for instance, f of a1 times a2 equals f of a1 times f of a2. And it also preserves the involution 
So f of a star equals f of a star. And finally, it preserves the unit, so f of 1 is equal to 1 as well. So it's a map that preserves all of, this, all of these structures. So what are some examples? So let's look at, um, we'll come back to this example later, let's first look at um, n by n matrices. So it turns out that every star homomorphism from, let's say, n by n matrices to, now we're going to have a different codomain, so let's just call it m by m matrices. So every star homomorphism is of the form. So if we apply f to a matrix, an n by n matrix A, then it turns out that, first of all, m is going to be of the form n times p for some non-negative integer p. And secondly, there's going to exist a unitary matrix, an m by m matrix, such that this map looks like the following. You take A and write it along the block diagonal of this codomain here. So U is a unitary, which just means that U star U equals the identity. And M equals N times P for some non-negative integer p. And actually, because our algebras are unital, um, we also demand that the unit is not equal to 0. Um, and in that case, these are always going to be um, positive integers. So this is what every star homomorphism looks like when you're going from a matrix algebra to another one. Another significantly more complicated example is if we take an arbitrary finite dimensional C star algebra, which is one of this form, and then we map it to um, another C star algebra of a similar form. So every star homomorphism from such a direct sum to another direct sum is going to be of the form now this is going to look much more complicated but first of all it's going to start off with a vector b b1 through bt. And where does this vector of matrices get sent to? Well, up to a unitary. It's going to get sent to a vector of matrices. And that vector of matrices is going to look like this, but now we have different inputs. So it's going to be a diagonal. So this is going to be a very big matrix. It's going to be the diagonal, a diagonal matrix whose entries are B11 several times, and then B22 several times, followed by B22 several times, followed by all the way down to BTT several times. And the number of times that the jth factor is inside of the ith factor is called the multiplicity of that associated star homomorphism when restricted to those two factors. So that's what, that's basically what all star homomorphisms look like. And the multiplicity could be different in each of these different parts. So the number of times, of times B, J appears in M, M, I 
is called the multiplicity. So it's called the multiplicity of that map from the jth factor into the ith factor. And it's quite interesting that every star homomorphism between finite C star algebra, finite dimensional C star algebras is described by maps like this. So it gives us sort of a classification of what the morphisms look like in this category of finite dimensional C star algebras and star homomorphisms, unital star homomorphisms between them.